the link to the Slido. But. Oh. All right. Uh, the Slido today is a vibe check, so fill that out. Tell us how you are feeling about the midterm post midterm. Uh, we are starting a new unit today, so that is exciting. It is arguably my favorite unit, um, and probably the section of data structures and algorithms that just like doesn't appear in the other courses at all, so this is really exciting. Um, but just while you're filling out that Slido, some administrative stuff. So one, uh, your exercise two grades were released over the weekend. That means that your exercise two regrades are due by this next weekend, the 7th. Please note that the exercise regrades are regrades, not resubmissions. Meaning, you submit a regrade request when you think that the rubric has been incorrectly applied. We got a lot of people that were sending us like, oh, I know I wrote this down, but I would have written this down instead. Unfortunately, while we're glad that you've done that work, that's not what that is for. Um, so make sure that you're only using the regrade requests when you want somebody to reevaluate how the rubric has been applied. That's what that is for. Now, if enough people say things and maybe give us feedback, I think I could be convinced to give you like a resubmission on one or two exercises. Usually I start to get those requests around this time of year once the midterm makes things feel very real. Uh, but reminder, exercise four, which was all just auto-graded stuff, that's going to be due this evening. It's all on heaps. Uh, and then exercise five releases this evening. FYI, exercise five will be out for two weeks, uh, mostly because you got a bunch of other stuff going on in the middle of this, and we didn't want to have too many due dates for you. So exercise five will not be due next Monday, but the Monday following. So it's like all of the graph stuff is going to be an exercise five. I will tell you that exercise five will probably about, be about the length of two exercises, just because it needs to cover that same number of uh, lectures kind of thing. Um, P3, though, P3 is not due this Wednesday. It's due the Wednesday following. Um, but like I mentioned last week, P3 was originally designed as a one-week assignment. We just wanted to give you extra time to do it because the plan is to release your midterm grades on Wednesday. And that with the release of your midterm grades, we will open up the online resubmission assignment. So remember, the way that this works is you did the first, you did the midterm the first time here, timed on paper. This Wednesday, we will open the via grade scope. It'll be a digital resubmission process. We have figured out a way for you to select only which questions you do want to resubmit. So if you're like, I like my grade on that problem, I don't want to redo it, you can just select that. Less writing for you, less grading for us, right? Um, and so you will have a week to resubmit your midterm. It is the exact same questions. <laughs> we are making no changes to it. You can sort of approach it as a total redo if you like. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to take your two scores from the resubmission and the original one and average them together. So like, let's say you got a 50% on the midterm the first time and then you crushed it because you like talked to your TAs and your you know, coworkers here and everybody, and you got 100% on the second one, you would end up with a 75 overall. Does anyone have any questions on the midterm resubmission process at this time? Yeah? Can we choose not to resubmit? You can totally choose not to resubmit. Then we will just keep your one score, and good for you. And that was sort of the idea behind the resubmission was that you know, if you had one of those amazing days of school and you just crushed it on that midterm day, great. You have a little less work. But if you are human like many of us and maybe that day didn't go the way you wanted it to, you get another chance at it. Yep. Cool. Um, okay, I think those were all my administrative announcements. Any other questions at this moment in time? Yeah. Yes, 
we will send you. So essentially what we're going to do is we, we took all of your papers and we scanned them ourselves because it's easier to grade for us digitally. And then we're going to hit publish and you're going to see the scanned copy of your exam along with like the points you got for each of the subsections. Yes. And then you will see, you know, what rubric items that you need to work on. Cool. Okay. Let's see. Let's see what's on the Slido. Let's see what's on the Slido. Oh, so you have all seen what's on the Slido, huh? Okay. Let's take a look. All right. Where is it? There we go. <laughs> Obama? <laughs> Very hard. I dislike it. Oh, I feel you, boo. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Um, so if you couldn't tell, we did do this exam a little bit more difficult because guess what? You get a retry at it. It's not interesting to redo an assignment that was too easy, right? Um, so that's why you get two approaches at this. Also because I will admit you could look at it a few different ways. I think it's kind of me to take all the easy questions of the midterm out of the midterm and put them on your exercises where you can do them without time limits, where you can talk to your friends and your TAs. But yeah, historically, you would have gotten these two questions plus a bunch of those like, what does the heap array implementation look like? Insert these numbers into a hash or whatever. We just took those and put those in your exercises instead. So you just got the super fun really rough questions on the midterm this round. But I guess you're not alone. Is that our takeaway from this? Cool. Yeah, sorry, hang on. Let me do this one thing really quick for the TAs. Da -da -da -da. Thank you. OK, sorry, sorry, sorry. You're now reading my things. Sorry. Don't look at that. <laughs> uh, there we go. There we go. OK, cool. All right. OK. Let's take a peek here. Now let's start this new unit. Great. OK, so. Uh, welcome to the graphs unit. Like I said, probably my favorite unit. Um, we are going to start today with just a bunch of vocabulary, which hopefully will be a nice little brain break for us from that midterm on Friday. So where are we sort of headed? Um, this course, Data Structures and Algorithms, you could argue is just entirely about pieces of data and the relationships between those pieces of data. Right? Previously, we'd been like obsessively talking about this dictionary ADT, which is where we have pairs of data that are then stored in some type of ordered relationship to one another to sort of optimize for this lookup, which is arguably a lot of what we do with data and computer science, that we take massive groupings of data, we store it somewhere, and then we use the computer to quickly find that piece of information at a later time. Um, so, in terms of the ways that we're able to store this information, the foundational piece is an array. That's actually what the memory of the computer looks like. Um, we just store the pure data. There's no real connection other than all the data has to be the same type. The only real relationship is that maybe we have this sort of idea of a sequence or an order within an array. Then we sort of meet trees. Trees now start to look like there's a bit more of a formal relationship, right? There's like, we even use it in terms of human relationships. There's parent nodes and child nodes. And there's this concept that like, maybe this overall ancestor has some relation to all of the little leaves down at the bottom, right? But trees kind of end up with this sort of like, hierarchical relationship that's really just singular directed, right? Like, a parent knows where its two children are, but unless you're a heap, you don't really know as a child who your parent is. There's just sort of the singular directed connection to go from one node to the child nodes. Well, welcome to graph land. Technically, 
Trees are a subset of these things we will refer to as graphs. Graphs are a way to store both elements and the relationships between them in codified computer science terms in ways that the computer can run all of the different things we need to run on these relationships. So now instead of just thinking about we need to store these pieces of information, now we are starting to store both pieces of information and the connections or relationships between those pieces of information. And we are starting to break apart all of the rules. Graphs, technically a tree is a subset of a graph, just like you could say a square is a more specific definition of a re rectangle. A tree is kind of a more specific definition of a graph. Everything is graphs. Uh, graphs are literally just what we are going to refer to as vertices or what will look like nodes to you and the connections between those things. Almost everything can be studied, can be represented. Graphs technically linked lists are graphs. They're nodes with connections in them. Heaps, trees, all of those are nodes with connections between them. Um, but it's not just data structures. Uh, graphs actually are sort of the backbone of a lot of the complicated things that you've probably been interacting with in terms of software. Uh, Google Maps database, guess what? All graphs. Uh, Facebook, anytime you type anything into the Facebook search, that is iterating over a graph. Technically what's happening there is the vertices are Facebook elements like profiles or groups or pages and then following or friends or likes or interactions are the relationships between them. GitLab history of a repository also stored as a graph where versions or changes are nodes and then the way that you've applied those changes are the relationships between them. You know, maybe one version is a node, a later version is another node and the connection between them is the change, uh, the merge request. Uh, those pictures of prerequisites in your programs, yes. Graphs, uh, family tree, that's a graph. Here are some applications of graphs. Uh, physical maps will come up a lot. So airline maps. Here we have vertices being maybe the individual airports and the edges being the flight paths that go between those individual airports. Uh, like I said, Google Maps is all a graph under the surface. And so what they have there is addresses are the vertices and maybe the roads to get between addresses are the vertices or the edges. But the thing is, is that the relationships don't just have to be physical. They could also be things like incline or decline, congestion, uh, delay because of construction, any sort of overlay like that. Now we're starting to think about those relationships as storing their own information. Uh, another very common use case of graphs in computer science is all social medias. So uh, vertices are often accounts, edges are followers or relationships. Here, this is an actual visualization of what we call a Twitter hub. Uh, this is a real thing that I did a lot at Microsoft is we were regularly running these graph visualizations over Twitter because they offered this API and we could find individuals that were influencers based on how many incoming follows they had around the keywords we cared about. And by doing this graph visualization, we would identify who we sent free stuff to. <laughs> um, traffic, yes, there you go. Uh, influence is another way to think about graphs. This one's a little more abstract. I stole this from a blog because I don't know anything about this. But here is a graph where you can see each of these little circles around are different types of protein is my understanding, and that each of these edges show the different types of biological processes that would transform each of these different molecules or proteins or cells. I'm going to be real, I don't understand enough about this. Maybe somebody here does. That would transform it from one state into another state, or how one thing influences another thing. Uh, and then also certainly uh, this graph here the blue and red ones, uh, that is actually a visualization of how Google does web page ranking. If you're not familiar with search engine optimization, which is just fancy lingo for fidgeting with your web page to make it show up higher in Google searches, 
Uh, really, one of the major key factors for that is who you link to from your website and who links to you. For example, if you write a website and nobody ever links to you, Google thinks you're pretty irrelevant. But if you write a website and then all of a sudden, the New York Times and the Washington Post and these huge hubs of influence start linking to your website, well, Google will think you're pretty relevant and will start to surface you higher up in the web page ranking. So this is actually a visualization of hyperlinks that connect various web pages across the internet. And that is one of the ways that Google finds these hubs of influence to give them different values of influence to show up higher in the search engine uh, algorithm. Those are the parts of the algorithm that Google releases publicly. It's kind of like the Coca-Cola secret recipe. There's only like five people at Google that know the whole algorithm uh, kind of thing. But these sort of interconnections are one of the key ways that your website shows up more. And that's all modeled by graphs. Same thing with Wikipedia articles. You can imagine all of those hyperlinks. The hyperlinks are the edges. The articles are the vertices. The web pages are the vertices. The hyperlinks between them are the edges. So let's look, oh yeah, and there you can look. This is probably the, thank you, past Casey. That's the uh, blog I pulled these things. All things graph, it's a really fun one. But let's look at a graph. Here is what a graph may look like. So I'm often going to draw these vertices as these little circles. I will probably at some point accidentally call them nodes. It's the same concept as a node but we will rarely implement them as their own independent object. Instead, we are gonna sort of do a bunch of different things and I'll show you in more detail. But for right now, if it helps in your brain, you can kind of imagine these as like nodes in a tree. And then those connections between them, we're gonna call those edges, different from links or references. Uh, in the tree, those were just links to tell you where to find the other node in memory, right? But now these edges themselves are gonna hold some of that key information. So the way that we technically define a graph is that we must have two sets. First, a set of vertices. So this graph is defined by the set of vertices A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. And then a set of edges, meaning the edges that are the connections between two vertices. So there you can see a set. So these two lists here are how we are going to formally define our graph. How we actually store those two sets in code, there's a lot of options and I'm gonna show them to you. So again, we're starting to like look at this almost like we think of those nodes with references, but we're actually, like the heap, not gonna store them in memory that way. They're gonna be stored as these types of sets, these lists of vertices and then a list of where they connect to. Any questions so far? Okay, great. Okay. Like I said, unfortunately, I got to just give you a bunch of vocab. That's why the first question on exercise five is all about vocab. So hopefully you'll be able to answer that today. Um, so when it comes to these edges, there's two types. There are undirected edges where you can see here we've got an undirected graph where we just have this link between Karen and Jim and then a link between Jim and Pam. If there is no arrow on either side, that means that edge is bi-directional. Jim can get to Pam, Pam can get to Jim. We just need one edge to represent that. Different from directed edges, so here you can see we have a Gunther edge pointing at Rachel, but unfortunately not one pointing back. But we do have this bi-directional uh, connection represented between Ross and Rachel as two directed edges, each pointing at one another. So if I was traveling through this graph, I can get from Gunther to Rachel, and I can get back and forth from Rachel to Ross, but I cannot get to Gunther. Different from the undirected version, where Jim and Karen have bi-directionality and Jim and Pam have bi-directionality. Any questions about that piece of it? Yes. Ah, so why can't we say commingle these things and have uh, an undirected graph or edge here then to represent bidirectionality? Because we typically, 
for ease of programming purposes, all edges are undirected or all edges are directed. So if we wanted to represent bidirectionality, we would have to have this sort of Ross-Rachel back and forth situation here. Just for implementation purposes, it's a hot mess to commingle them. Cool. Uh, so edges are how we connect the vertices, either directed or undirected. That gives us the degree of a vertex. When I say degree of a vertex, I mean the number of edges connected to that vertex. If it's undirected, it's just the degree. So in our undirected graph, each of these, um, you know, sorry, this needs to be a two. Karen has a degree of one, Pam has a degree of one, but Jim has a degree of two. That's what's happening there. If it is directed, then we have a distinction between in degree and out degree. Uh, where in degree is the number of edges coming in towards a uh, vertex versus out degree, the number of edges leaving that vertex going to another one. Again, just sort of fun terminology. Okay, more terminology. Um, okay, so the other weird thing about graphs is because they are represented as, a, as two sets, I don't need to rely on the connections to travel the graph, which means these graphs up here are totally valid. So this is a graph, the F, the E, and the G that are connected to one another, and then this J that's just kind of like hanging out by itself. This collection of four vertices is a valid graph, even if J does not have a connection to the other vertices. But that's okay, because I probably have a set, and I would you know, be storing it. And that way, I don't need a connection to it uh, to prevent it from getting garbage collected, because that's not how I'm actually storing it. Same thing over here, this A, B, C, and D. That is a legitimate graph, though the D technically does not have any connection to the other vertices. If all vertices are connected, we say that the graph is connected. So if there existed a connection from this J to this F, that would make this a connected graph. Now, within the context of directed graphs, a directed graph is weakly connected if all of the vertices are still connected, if we just transform every you know, directed edge into an undirected edge. So like if we added one more connection between this C and this D, that would make this a weakly connected graph. But a strongly connected graph is one where there exists a way to get from every vertex to every other vertex. You can imagine that would be a lot of edges in this case, where we would have from every single edge, like from A, we would have a link to B, to C, to D. From B, we would have a connection to A, to C, to D. From C, we would have a connection to A, to B, to D, and so on and so forth. That would be a strongly connected graph. And we already talked about degree. Um, so that's about connectivity. A path, that's just the term for a sequence of connected vertices, um, sometimes called a walk. Uh, so for example, O, P, I, M, N. That is a path that moves through the entirety of this connected graph. A cycle is one, is a path where I leave and then return to the starting vertex. So I think I could technically, no, I don't think there's a path in this, like a cycle in this one, right? Like I couldn't go P, M, N, there's no way to get back to P, that path doesn't exist, or that cycle doesn't exist. But a cycle is if there exists a way for you to leave and return. You know, in this one, I could leave O, go to P, go to M, go to N, go back, go to I, go to P, and go back to O, all those things are connected, I could find a cycle within that graph. Yes. Is a strongly connected graph realistic in large data sets? Of course, it totally depends on the scenario. Um, but you will often find, uh, sometimes we would refer to that as a really dense graph. A graph that is dense is one that has a lot of uh, edges in comparison to vertices. And you will find, yeah, in practicality, we almost always have more vertices than necessarily edges, but of course it totally depends on the scenario you are modeling. Great. Um, so we also have this sort of idea of 
acyclic versus cyclic. Um, so you can see some examples here. So here is a directed acyclic graph because A I cannot get back to after I leave it, but a cycle here, we have a directed cycle, we can go all the way back around to A. So here's no cycle, here's a cycle. Here is an acyclic undirected graph, but here's a nice cycle with the undirected. Yes, question. Uh, I prefer mm -hmm. Yes. So for example, the, this is not a weakly connected graph. Yes, good clarifying. Is definitely not a strongly connected graph. Yes, it is not. It has, has no minimum bar of connectivity because that uh, D vertex is just hanging out without connection. Rough times. Yes. Paths can exist on what? Sorry. So in this situation, there exists a path from A to B to C, but there does not exist a path to D. Yeah. So for the two connected examples the bottom, the one straight line, do you consider strongly connected or the ones that are um, one directionally connected, do you say are strongly connected? So I would say because this is a undirected graph, I would just call this connected. In a directed graph, this here is technically a weakly connected graph because if I were to transform each of these directed edges, to undirected, still all the vertices would be connected. But it doesn't meet my strongly requirement that I, like for example, oh, can't get to all of the other vertices. Cool, okay, yeah. Yes, yeah, so we only have the strongly and weakly distinctions in directed graphs because that doesn't really apply to undirected as much, so because of the bi-directionality of things. So if I'm asking for a strongly directed graph, I'm asking for a, or a strongly connected graph, I'm asking for a directed graph where there is a way leaving every vertex to get to every other vertex. It's a pretty high bar, I'll say to me. Yes. Cool. Okay, so that's about the connections. But now keep in mind, we need to think about how we communicate data. So the vertices and the edges give us the sort of layout of the relationship, but there's probably pieces of information we need along with it. So often the vertices will have a label. You can think of this as the data field, but technically you could store multiple things associated with each vertex. But it is most common for the vertex to have a singular piece of data stored inside of it. We call that the vertex label. They'll probably look like this when I draw them kind of thing. But also equally common is to have edge labels. The edge labels are often the things that we need in order to determine the cost of a path. For example, in our Google Maps scenario, each of our vertices is an address and each of our edges is a street that connects those addresses. But there's lots of different ways that you can calculate the distance between two addresses. You could calculate it in miles. You could calculate it in minutes to drive. You could calculate it maybe in tolls or how much traffic is going to be on that route. All of those are different pieces of information that you might store in the edges. But for simplicity's sake, most of our graphs will look like what you see here on the right hand side where there's one piece of information per vertex and one piece of information per edge. But you can make it as complicated as you want. <laughs> you could see something like this. Um, this is very rare. That's probably not going to happen much in this class, but you don't actually have to do it. Most of what you're going to see are graphs that look like this. Okay. So here's the thing, because the vertices now are their own entity in terms of our pieces of information, they're not just sort of like passive connections like they are in the tree situation. Well now, when we're talking about the runtime through graphs, 
we don't just have a singular n value. So if I ask you the runtime of a graph, I do not expect you to give me an answer in terms of n. I expect you to give me an answer in terms of v, which is the count of vertices, and e, the count of edges. So all of the runtime analysis for graphs will be multivariable analysis. You can read these delightful paragraphs. Uh, and really, this is just saying, now we are going to always be thinking of whatever operations we run on the graph. How many times do we visit each of the vertices? How many times do we need to travel each of the edges? So for example, graph linear, instead of being O of n, would be O of v plus e. I think that's what it says on the slide. This will make more sense as we get into it. But let's talk about how we actually would implement these magical graphs. OK, so this is one of the ways. This is called the adjacency matrix approach. We've got a two-dimensional array. And these rows here represent each of the vertices. So you can see here is a graph. And we've got vertices 0 through 6. So each row and each column represent a vertex. So a adjacency matrix is always a square. And then to represent an edge, in this case, undirected edges, we see if we've got this edge between 0 and 1. That means I can go from vertex 0 to 1 and from vertex 1 to 0. So what that means is in my adjacency matrix, I initially fill it all up with zeros. You can think of that as being the value false. So you just imagine this is like an array of falses. And then to represent the presence of an edge, I would go in and I would say, well, to get from 0 to 1, that would be row 0, column 1. I'm going to change that false to a true. And because it's undirected, that means I can go also from 1 to 0. And so then I update that to be a true as well. So for undirected graphs, I have two true entries per edge. For directed graphs, I just have one entry per edge. Any questions? So then maybe here is a question posed to all of you. When we think about the trade-offs, what is going to be really cheap and easy to do? for this type of graph. What type of operation is going to be cheap and easy to do? You can see some of our lists of operations here. Adding an edge, removing an edge, checking an edge exists, getting out neighbors, getting in neighbors, maybe adding a vertex, removing a vertex. Why don't you go ahead and take two minutes, discuss with those around you. What is the implication of these types of operations in this representation of a graph? Go ahead, chat for a few minutes. Let's chat about it. Let's chat about it. Can anybody maybe raise their hand and tell me what's one of these operations we think would be particularly efficient 
in this graph implementation? What's something where we're like, oh yeah, I can see directly how to do that. That would be nice and efficient. Yes, please. Adding what? Yes. Yeah, adding any of the connections, right? Adding any of the connections is access this location in the two-dimensional array, which is constant time, and flip it from a zero to a one. Totally. What's another one that's a very efficient uh, implementation here? Yeah. Removing edge. Absolutely. Exactly the same parallel, right? I'm just going to pop right in, swap something over. Yeah. Okay, what's maybe something that is not efficient in this model? What's something that would be unnecessarily uh, inefficient if we had to make an alteration to this graph? Yeah. Ooh, getting out edges. Yeah, because the way that I would get out edges in this situation is I would go to a row, and then I would have to search all the way across that row. So I'd be like, hey, this one, this one, this one. So you're right. I sort of have to do number of V checks to find the out edges. What's another thing that could be unnecessarily inefficient? Yeah. Yeah, you. Right here. Sorry. Ooh, there's a lot of empty space. I agree. The space that this takes up, can anybody tell me what the space that this takes up would be in terms of our variables V or E? Anybody guess it? Yeah, sure, please. Yes, exactly. And I hear N squared, but I, my brain corrected it to V squared, which is what I assume, because we were all going to say the word N a million times when we're getting used to these new variables. But you're absolutely right. V squared, which in this case kind of looks like there's a lot of unnecessary space. Can anyone see another sort of change to the graph that might be like really painfully inefficient given this situation? Yeah, sure. Yes, thank you. I know I was asking you to invent something that's not on the slide, mean of me. But you're absolutely right. Adding or removing a vertex in this case means I have to recreate this whole matrix. Pain in the booty. But if you have a really steady state of vertices and you're just going to be swapping the edges a bunch, this is a really good one. So adjacency matrix tends to come in use whenever we have a steady state of vertices and either a dense amount of edges or an edges amount that are going to change very regularly. And you can go through and you can look at these. There you go. Great. Great. OK. Here, hang on. There it is. Here is the adjacency list. Uh, implementation of a graph. I will tell you right now, this is the far more popular implementation of a graph. So an adjacency list graph has some type of structure that contains an option for each of the vertices. So you can see here what we've got is we've technically got like an array. <laughs> and this array has a index for each vertex. And then the array right now stores a linked list that represents all of the vertices to which this vertex can travel. So you can see in this directed graph situation, we can get from A to B and to C. And so we have B and C as the linked list hanging off of A. B has an out degree of zero. So it has an empty entry in this adjacency list. Which is fine because technically, like this edge right here is already stored by the presence of this B in this list. So I don't need to store it as an incoming as well. So that's one thing that's nice. We were kind of duplicating entries in the adjacency matrix. We're not doing that in this case. Um, C, you can see, gets from C to B and from C to D. So we've got B and D in its adjacency. D can only get to A. So we see that A is in its adjacency list there. Yes. Ah, good question. Is there a reference stored within each linked list? Right now, this image that we have here is all imaginary, just like our heap, sort of, where we kind of drew the heap, but like we were really just storing it as values in an array. Same thing here. This is just a linked list of the labels, not actually of references. So we've made no new nodes or anything. We're just storing these as lists of values. So you can imagine then to add an edge, 
Well, adding an edge, then we just need to pop into one of these locations and add another thing. Great. Removing an edge. Uh, then again, we're just deleting one of these nodes. Getting all of the neighbors. It's just returning the list off of something. Um, the thing that is kind of annoying is we don't measure the, like we don't currently store the incoming. So to get all the incoming neighbors of B, I'd have to loop through the whole thing and find wherever B exists. So that can be a little expensive. Um, but we've now changed our storage. Instead of being uh, V squared, it's now V plus E, essentially, because we've got one entry for the existence of every edge, and we've got an um, outerlying array for each of the set of vertices. Let's make it a little more efficient. What if, instead of using linked lists, to store the set of neighbors, we used hash tables to store the set of neighbors. Then what we would have, essentially, is we've got a hash here on the outer level, where we've got like a sort of map to index 0. We know at index 0 is where we will find all of the neighbors of A. And then we've got a hash table here, where we've also got a way to look up, like, hey, can I get from A to B? Boom, hash table, constant time lookup. From B to C, boom, constant time lookup. This is the much more popular implementation. Uh, I think it looks a little funnier. You could certainly argue that it's a little less memory efficient. But in terms of speed, it is so uh, efficient that this typically is the most popular implementation of a graph. Any questions? What if I told you your P4, you will be implementing a graph? Yes, I know. Don't worry. I have so many more things to make it so much more complicated than this. Wait until we get to the algorithms. It'll be a good time. There is a reason that P4 is, I think we give you straight up three weeks to do it for context. OK. I talked about these things. We've got a few more minutes. Let's talk about what I think is the most fun part of graphs. The reason I love graphs, y'all, is because the reason I love computers is because they are about taking human problems and translating them to these magical devices. And nothing is more flexible than a graph. I think graphs are really the first time that we have the flexibility to truly represent the complexity of the human world. So let's talk about some examples. Um, in fact, I think you should probably take a couple minutes. Maybe that's what we'll do. Um, so here you can see a few different contexts of how you might store information in a graph. So we've got the internet, how we store you know, all the web pages and the ways to get around web pages. We've got a family tree. Maybe that's how we're storing individuals in an ancestral image and their connections. We've got the sort of Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, if you've ever heard of that game. It's this idea that every actor that's ever been in a movie, you can find uh, six degrees of separation between Kevin Bacon and every other actor. So how would you maybe model that with a graph? We've got course prerequisites. How do you know which classes you need to take in order to be able to take a given class? And then maybe uh, ways to walk between your buildings. How do you navigate around? Why don't you take, uh, take three minutes, chat with each other, and then we'll come back together and we'll discuss this for the last minute class. Go ahead. How would you represent it? What are the vertices? What are the edges? Directed or undirected?
All right, just in the interest of time, can anyone tell me what would be the vertices and what would be the edges for the internet representation? Anyone? Vertices and edges for, to represent the internet? Yeah. Uh, routers or IP addresses, Ooh. Ooh, I like that, the physicality. Yes, I absolutely agree. Like routers or hubs, maybe those are the vertices, and then the physical lines that connect those things could totally be edges, absolutely. Uh, you could also say like vertices are the web pages and edges are the connections between them. All of those things are reasonable. Uh, let's say, here's what I write, there you go. Uh, family tree, what are the vertices, what are the edges, anyone? Yeah, sure. Sure, yeah, something about familial relations or the edges between them. Often you have like a parent-child kind of thing. Maybe you have a dotted line for sibling or something, but I feel like it's often vertices are the people, and then the lines are maybe who gave birth to whom or <laughs> was somehow involved in that. Um, okay, what about the Kevin Bacon one? Uh, what are our vertices? What are our edges in that case? Anyone? Yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly. So the vertices would be the actors, and then maybe the edges are like how they know one another, like maybe a movie they did together, or a project, or like friendships, or something like that kind of thing. Absolutely. Uh, what about course prerequisites? What's our situation there? What would be our vertices? What would be our edges? We're trying to figure that out. Anyone? Yeah. 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 So what are our vertices then? Classes are the vertices, and then our edges are what requires what. So you're right. So it's like maybe 142 points to 143 kind of thing. Cool, love it. And then what about ways to walk between you know, buildings? What are our vertices? Anyone? Yeah, in the back? Pathways, yeah, exactly. So maybe buildings are the vertices, and the pathways are the edges. You can get so deep into this, we are going to talk about how to model things for the rest of this unit, but if you're interested, I've got a bunch of hilarious scenarios. You can read, these are old midterm questions in here. Uh, party planning, things like that. Come back on Wednesday. Now that you know what a graph is, we're gonna talk about some of the graph algorithms that will tell you magical things about the data once you have it all set up in a graph.